Cool. Hi, so today I'm here with Anastasia Makareva, um, who's been working on the biotic pump, um, how evapotranspiration can cool, and also looking at wet regimes um, in the forest. Um, so welcome, I'm glad you could make it here. Yeah. Thank you very much for your interest, for inviting me to talk about our work. Thank you, yeah. my pleasure. Cool. Um, do you want to just say a little bit about the, your background and uh, how you got into studying um, mm. this area? Mm. Uh, you know, uh, actually, I had a background in physics and mathematics originally. So I graduated from uh, Leningrad Polytechnical Institute, uh, now St. Petersburg uh, State uh, Polytechnical University, uh, on the faculty of physics uh, and mechanics. But on this faculty, we had a <clears throat> department of biophysics and um, uh, Professor Viktor Goshkov was uh, teaching there and he became my mentor. And later uh, we cooperated for like 20 years, uh, more than 20 years. And he was the uh, originator of the biotic regulation concept he is a theoretical, he was a theoretical physicist by education and his first part of his career. But at the same time, he had a very strong interest in living biosphere, in how life works. He traveled a lot in wild ecosystems of the former Soviet Union in Siberia on the White Sea. And at a certain point, he changed his conventional career of theoretical physics, which was quite successful. And he made this very sharp transition and began to study the life environment interaction. And he came up with a very original perspective, uh, uh, like uh, following his own path. Uh, uh, that um, it is not possible to explain uh, the habitability of the earth, which has been habitable like for at least several billion years without uh, uh, accepting that life uh, itself uh, regulates those, those conditions uh, which are uh, favorable for life. So, um, um, in the West, uh, this is was known like Gea, but uh, for Gorshkov, it was his own independent path, and in fact, is different uh, in several important aspects. But that's it. And so um, I was very um, impressed by this grand perspective of, of on the meaning of life. Actually, it gave the meaning to life because it is not just you know fighting for for a better place under the sun as we are taught in biology classes you know uh, adaptation natural selection a survival of the fittest all that stuff but that life uh, uh, has a meaning in the sense that uh, all organisms must do something to support uh, the environment. And so the challenge, the scientific challenge is how to explain all this uh, without going to, without, you know, involving like God or something to purely you know, with the sci remaining within science. And it is uh, inherently interdisciplinary. So you cannot, uh, you cannot stay with one or another discipline with climatology or evolutionary biology or genetics. You need a totally um, uh, comprehensive and holistic view and you have to analyze uh, evidence uh, from different fields uh, such that you make a um, uh, non-contradictory coherent picture. Uh, and so I was impressed by this perspective. Uh, uh, and so I joined uh, Victor in this research. And um, <clears throat> the biotic pump, uh, which actually is uh, 
how the forest ecosystem uh, controls its own water cycle. It is just one of the aspects of this bigger biotic regulation process. So if the premise is that life's, a life uh, controls its own environment, so uh, obviously for terrestrial life, there is one more thing to control, which is water. Oceanic life doesn't have this, doesn't have to bother about water, right? So, but for terrestrial life, uh, due to elevation, due to gravity, uh, water is being continuously lost from land. So it is a problem, water availability. And th that is why from the general principles of the biotic regulation, one should expect that there must be some kind of control of the water cycle. And it so happened that uh, in 2004, uh, we were contacted by uh, Professor Antonio Nobre, uh, who worked in the uh, Institute of Space Research in Brazil. And he read our book on biotic regulation published in 2000. And he said that I'm so impressed with biotic regulation, you must apply these principles to the Amazon because the Amazon is absolutely unique. We have these flying rivers crossing the equator, uh, majestic, very powerful water cycle. You must like focus on that and produce something within your concept. So we were tasked, you know, uh, uh, and um, um, he, uh, so uh, he somehow, um, encouraged and challenged us uh, with this. Uh, so he basically brought the Amazon forest into our lives. So here, here you are, you see. So at a certain moment, our life was with the Amazon rainforest. We are Russian, we are Russian, you know, physicists by training, doing some research, rather theoretical, Mm, and at a certain point, we have this huge Amazon forest, and we cannot go anywhere in our research, but the forest is here. And um, so um, uh, I cannot explain how it happened because we consider uh, the formulation of the biotic pump to be our very, very big achievement. Like we are very lucky. Uh, it happened, uh, nah, but um, at that time we were doing research on climate stability. Is it okay that I'm talking and talking? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> so uh, do, okay. do you do you want to just say uh, what the biotic pump is? What 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 is? That? Ah, yes, the biotic pump. The biotic pump basically is um, the um, physical and ecological uh, process by which the forest, natural forest, uh, uh, brings water evaporated from over the ocean to land. This involves uh, two things. One is there must be horizontal wind, you know, so water is evaporated over the ocean, then there is wind that brings it over land, and then you need to extract this water from this flow for so uh, uh, convection must be initiated and then there is precipitation and this water rains out precipitates over the forest so the forest ensures that this process goes in such a way that it brings enough uh, water to compensate for the runoff for the loss of liquid water to the ocean mm. so so uh, yes, so that's it. So, so, so even... basically, oh. so basically mm -hmm. you're saying, I think you started with the idea that biology can actually control the weather, right? And so mm -hmm. we know that trees can evapotranspire more to cool and less, you know, when they don't need to as much. But what you're mm -hmm. also saying, I think, is that as the water vapor goes up above the forest, when it condenses, it actually creates this 
uh, kind of a vacuum that then brings in wind from the ocean and draws in water moisture. Yes, yes, yes. That's uh, that's that's true. Uh, uh, but this is uh, um, there were some misinterpretations around the, about this. Uh, because, for example, in the Amazon forest, we do know that this happens precisely as you said. So there is transpiration, there is moistening of the atmosphere, and then there is a wind from the ocean and from the Atlantic Ocean and the wet season starts. But for example, in the higher latitudes, there, uh, like uh, over the boreal forest, there is already horizontal wind. So there is like, um, there are patterns, uh, geophysical patterns of air circulation, which are there irrespective of there is forest or there isn't forest. And so when there is horizontal airflow, then the forest modifies it in such a way that it takes water from this horizontal airflow. Because if if there is no convection, then this horizontal airflow doesn't bring uh, in any water. It just uh, comes in and goes away. So, uh, so the forest then controls this um, uh, process of convection when the air rises, cools, uh, water vapor condenses, and there is precipitation. So it depends. It depends on the uh, geophysical conditions, which which uh, uh, aspect of this process is uh, more is um, more uh, controlled by the forest. Uh, you see, okay. so the, it is very important that there must be uh, so flying rivers are not enough. It is not enough that uh, you sit uh, on land and there is something going above your head. You need to take water vapor from this flow. And to take it, you need to arrange a convection and the precipitation, so rising air motion. So it, it may be that there is some uh, motion, for example, when the uh, air hits the mountain, for example, it rises and there is, uh, uh, so this is geophysical, uh, but a, a forest can um, provide its own uh, uh, impact on this process. Yeah. So the forest causes um, when the when the water vapor condenses, it sucks up air, and that convection pattern uh, it, interacts yes. with so the atmospheric is, rivers is, and kind of yeah, attracts yeah. the. And my, and for no, 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 yes. Now about the physical mechanism, how it works. First of all, that uh, the key mechanism is that the forest adds water vapor to the atmosphere. So the atmosphere becomes more humid than it would without forest. And there is general agreement that a moist atmosphere has a different dynamics than a dry atmosphere. So there is no, nothing new that we would be saying. What we are saying is that indeed, when there is a condensation of water vapor, so uh, indeed uh, we have less gas after a condensation. And then uh, uh, when uh, water vapor condenses, there is first an upward, Airflow because of uh, the partial um, partial vacuum, as you as you wish, uh, when the uh, water vapor has condensed, and then after there is a, a redistribution of air because we have hydrostatic equilibrium in the gravity field, all this pressure shortage finds itself uh, closer to the surface and then we have also the um, horizontal air inflow to this uh, zone of uh, low pressure so this is how it works and um, uh, so this is this uh, uh, reliance on uh, pressure drop uh, caused by condensation is what is new in what we have proposed in this, in is, this, this um, 
Does this happen, say, above a lake? When water evaporates from a lake, does it have this same, uh, when it, it condenses oh. and then forms a cloud above a lake, does that also, uh, does this attract Every, your problem? Absolutely, everywhere. Like we thought when we first formulated it, uh, like a principle, uh, we started from the premise that uh, there must be this process and we looked for a physical mechanism for it. Uh, and um, uh, when we uh, came uh, to this um, formulation of the uh, uh, pressure disequilibrium that forms upon condensation, we thought that the simplest way uh, to test it would be to apply to geophysical phenomena, like where condensation is most intense, which are tropical cyclones. You see, uh, tropical cyclones are uh, uh, atmospheric vortices, uh, which have a strong upwelling air motion in their center and a huge amount of precipitation there. So we thought if our mechanism does work, we should be able to, to explain characteristic velocities in hurricanes. So uh, like already, uh, we published the first uh, paper on the biotech pump in 2007, and in 2008, we published uh, our first paper on hurricanes, and where we showed that indeed it is, uh, this mechanism ex explains the characteristic uh, hurricane and typhoons velocity. And I can tell you how. So every person with the physical background uh, should be able to <laughs> understand it. So we have water vapor partial pressure, right? Like at uh, 30, degrees Celsius, we have like 40 hectopascal uh, partial pressure saturated. So tropical atmosphere. So mm, 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 pressure has the unit of energy per uh, cubic, per, per volume, per cubic meter, for example. So it is energy density. So if we think that it is due to pressure reduction from condensation that these huge hurricane velocities are produced. Then this uh, energy density should be transformed to kinetic energy density, right? So we just equate partial pressure of water vapor to kinetic energy of a unit volume of atmosphere, which is squared velocity divided by two and multiplied by density, just like, you know, mv squared divided by two. And imagine uh, how we were excited. We didn't know anything about these things before we came to the field. When from this simple, uh, like scaling relationship, you get this 70 meters per second, which is a, uh, like uh, gold standard scale for hurricane intensity, just from characteristic partial pressure of water vapor in the tropics, you immediately get the scale. Mm. So, so I, I just want to uh, ex explain that just to the listener that partial pressure, what partial pressure is. So you have many different types of molecules in the air, like nitrogen, oxygen. So each component creates its own pressure in the air and so the water has its own pressure so that's what partial pressure is mm -hmm. and, 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 so, and i guess what you're doing is you you started out with the biotic pump for over forests but now you're saying and it, you know it also applies to lakes but now you're saying that this is the mechanism you found for hurricanes and it's quite a different mechanism than the usual meteorological mechanism for the hurricane which is that hot air is rising but you're saying that there's this extra thing that the water condenses at the top of the hurricane and sucks up the hurricane. You can actually calculate the velocity of the hurricane, um, which yes. in traditional meteorological explanations with the with the hot air parcel. Uh, uh, look, can that explain uh, look, that? Uh, do the same calculations, or is that uh, a different? Uh, you know that uh, you know that hurricanes form over uh, 
uh, isothermal surface, oceanic surface. So there is no hot air that would rise, right? It is uh, so in um, traditional meteorology, uh, um, what you are referring to this hot air rising, it is not uh, so. Um, so where, where does this heat come from? Uh, this heat come from latent heat release, which is another thing that accompanies uh, condensation, right? When we have condensation, we have a partial pressure reduction, right? And latent heat release. What is this? What is latent heat? When uh, sunlight uh, heats the water surface, uh, and there is evaporation, so a certain part of solar energy is spent to extract the vapor molecule from liquid, right? To, to overcome the uh, intermolecular attraction forces, right? So, and this, uh, uh, this energy uh, is released back uh, in what is called latent heat when there is condensation in the upper uh, troposphere, like at the average height of five kilometers. And due to this fact that there is this latent heat released, when the air uh, rises, it becomes warmer. It cools, right? But it cools less than in the surrounding atmosphere where there is no ascent. And due to this uh, differential uh, like effect that here we have uh, uh, an average atmosphere like with 6.5 kelvins per kilometer lapse rate. And here in, in the hurricane core, we have a welling and the air um, cools less than that. We have this so-called moist adiabatic lapse rate, which can be five or four degrees per, per kilometers. And so here in the area of ascent, the air becomes warmer than the surroundings. And it is not uh, actually the theory uh, that is accepted right now, still accepted as an explanation it doesn't involve any buoyancy. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing this right, uh, but when when it's something floats, warm air floats, it 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 can all be explained totally in balance, just to the fact due to the fact that this rising air is relatively warmer, so pressure here in the upper troposphere is higher, and it pushes the air away from the area of ascent. And if it pushes away, so the pressure uh, below becomes uh, low because there is less air in the column. And so this is how the hurricane is formed in the traditional uh, picture. You see, there is no, uh, no warming in sense of that something is warm and is rising. No, there is, is a thermal, uh, sea surface and over this this happens this thing latent heat release here it is warmer it pushes the air away and so here the air pressure becomes uh, lower but there are many problems with this uh, 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 explanation and if you look at our publications we are on the way of uh, explicating these problems uh, and uh, I'm quite positive that uh, soon we will uh, <clears throat> uh, have some like <laughs> phase change in uh, in the general understanding of how it works. But still, it is difficult. There is inertia which is understandable, and we must overcome it. Uh, I must say that any idea in science must be checked for sanity. You know. <laughs> So, so it is normal. But this picture that I explained to you is incorrect. Okay, and cool. I can tell you briefly why. Briefly, imagine that you have this 
warm air here, right? But it is a closed air circulation. So this warm air must go down somewhere. And when warm air must go down, so you need to uh, perform work on it. You need basically to push it uh, down. So all work that you gain here, when it goes up, you uh, uh, spend there pushing it down. And so the uh, net uh, gain of power that is available to run, to run the, the whole vorte uh, vortex appears to be quite small. So this latent heat, it, it does exist. And on a qualitative level, it's OK. But quantitatively, it is very small to explain the observed winds. OK. So, so cool. this basic idea. OK, nice. Um, do you want to just step back a little bit? How did you guys come up with the biotic pump theory in the first place? Or what made you think yes, of it? This is, this is what, uh, what I was telling you. Uh, that when Antonio uh, Nobre contacted us, we were at the time working on uh, climate stability because it is also a problem that our living planet, planet with life on it also has the hydrosphere in its liquid state. So how can it be that there is this liquid state and it doesn't go either to complete glaciation or to evaporation when life is not possible and catastrophic runaway greenhouse. So we think that it is due to life and we were exploring how to, how to explain this. And uh, while we were doing that, we uh, understood this very um, important property of our atmosphere, which is that we have gravity and it, when the air rises uh, in the gravity field, uh, we have, uh, um, and when it rises without heat exchange with the surroundings, it cools and this cooling uh, can be calculated uh, very straightforwardly. Uh, uh, and it is, can be compared like you know when a ball jumps uh, up and down. So its kinetic energy is zero in the uppermost position, but potential energy is highest. And so, so it like alternates. And so when the air goes up, so its temperature is reduced like kinetic energy. So kind of, but the, the most interesting thing is that as this temperature goes down, the, um, the water vapor cannot stay, uh, uh, cannot stay in the gaseous phase because it becomes, so, if the water vapor uh, didn't condense, it would be oversaturated. So it is due to this, um, combination of uh, uh, two constant, gravitational constant and latent heat, uh, 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 latent heat uh, constant, that in our atmosphere, when the air rises, the water vapor must condense. And that is why water vapor is not in, equi in, is not in equilibrium in the gravitational field. If our atmosphere has a scale height of like nine kilometers, so in the, in the gravitational field, the water vapor has a scale height of just two kilometers due to this fact. So it is strongly compressed compared to the rest of the atmospheric gases. It is uh, all, uh, it is never in equilibrium. And this must, we thought, this must have very profound consequences for the atmospheric dynamics. And when we were faced with this uh, uh, challenge to explain how the Amazon rainforest produces its rain, we were convinced that this must play a role, this 
uh, non equilibrium disequilibrium of water vapor so and and then and then we thought that if the forest adds moisture to the atmosphere and brings it closer to saturation it can start this process of condensation so uh, it is like um, like an avalanche to 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 switch on an avalanche to release this uh, um, uh, dynamic power associated with the non-equilibrium distribution of water vapor. Okay, so. cool. So, so yeah, so you kind of had this really interesting larger picture because I guess like Venus, the water vapor just evaporates and becomes disappears as a greenhouse, and and in the Mars, it's all condenses to very cold yeah. ice, right? And so somehow the Earth, we're right at this in between stage where it's 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 changing. So your question was, you were trying to figure that out. And so then Antonio Nobre asked you to look at the rainforest and you were thinking maybe the rainforest kind of contributes to this whole, to the movement of the whole water vapor, right? And so you were looking, so that's, that's what motivated you to think about um, this, this biotic pump theory, because like, as the, as the, as I guess, as the water vapor rises, um, it, it releases, it releases heat, that latent heat. And so some, so there's something about that that you thought maybe contributed to the whole movement of the water. Is that right? Kind of. How well, kind of, kind of without latent heat. Okay, <laughs> so without, without the latent the, heat. Okay. Without the latent heat, the latent heat uh, constant, which I mentioned, it is uh, necessary. Um, it uh, actually determines the degree to which the water vapor is um, like squeezed compared to other gases. Uh, so we could think uh, of uh, how, how, what the temperature lapse rate should be such that the air rises, cools, but there is no condensation. And it should be around 1.2 uh, degrees Kelvin. If, if, in our, if we change the gravity field of Earth now, such that the air rises, uh, just by 1.2 Kelvin uh, per kilometer. So there won't be condensation and there won't be any dynamics associated with condensation. So, and the latent heat constant just determines this, but the physical mechanism, which uh, we think is dominant, is not the latent heat release, but the pressure reduction. Uh, associated due to condensation okay yeah I, so yeah maybe i should just define for some of the listeners um what latent heat is so latent heat is when so water in a liquid form when it uh turns into vapor it it that water vapor can actually carry away some of the heat and then when it actually that water vapor um condenses back into liquid water it actually releases some of that heat um and so that heat so when it forms a cloud you actually release a bit of heat back to the atmosphere and then um yeah, I just want to define what a lapse rate is for the listeners. So, uh, or at least this is what I understand lapse rate to be. So when a air, so you have air and as it kind of, as you go up in the atmosphere, that air kind of expands. So the temperature naturally goes down a little bit. And so the lapse rate of, of dry air is just um, how the temperature uh, drops as you go up. But of, uh, of the moist lapse rate, because the water vapor Kind of begins to condense as you go up right you have to take that into account and so and it also releases a bit of heat this latent heat the the air temperature of the moisture lapse rate is decreases a little bit slower as you go up no. is that a correct definition mm -hmm. of the lapse mm -hmm. rate? yeah yes 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 but you also can see uh, because why the air expands when it goes up why because it is in the gravity field right so it is the uh, the equilibrium distribution of air in the gravity field is such that there is less air up and more down, right? So you can see, uh, you can look at this cooling of rising air uh, as, as this expansion is due to gravity 
after all. So it is, you can look at it like the interplay between uh, potential and internal energy. So potential energy grows when it goes up an air parcel, right? But uh, internal energy at the expense of which it uh, goes up uh, reduces. So this is like a complementary view on what you just said. So it is related. Uh, so, so um so uh, if you're, I heard of like hang gliders or, or you know people in these paragliders, they're flying. Sometimes they can get sucked underneath a cloud. So they have to be careful. They don't fly right under a cloud and they get sucked up. It's called cloud suck. Is that what you're saying? The biotic pump yes. would, would be responsible yes. for this yes. cloud suck? Yes, yes. That's, that's lo how it local uh, locally is pronounced. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, what is important? The scale is important because imagine that you have a, uh, from what you began, there is a cloud over a lake or something like an isolated cloud. For example, uh, like a temperature dropped, like some sun goes down, uh, temperature drops, and there is a condensation uh, and a small cloud has formed. What happens then? Then, when you have a zone of condensation, the pressure has lowered, and so you have an inflow of air from all directions, right, to this, to this small cloud. And if all this air just goes and meets here, and no uh, consistent circulation develops, so there will be nothing. So one, uh, in, in this sense, one cloud uh, won't, uh, you know, run you biotic pump. But when you imagine now that you have a big forest, like 100 kilometers or 10 times the atmospheric scale height, and there is uh, like concerted action of all trees because uh, they have all the same genetic program, what to do. So, and you have clouds over all these territory. Then, then you have a uh, preferential direction for circulation to form because there will be a large zone of air pressure and then there will be inflow to this, to this area and ascent and there will be like an opportunity for the right geometry of the air circulation to form and for uh, moisture to be brought in uh, to the forest, you see. So, so it is. It is also also the uh, how high convection is is also important because if it is low, then there will be a re restoration of equilibrium from above, and so there will be this type of air flow to this zone of low pressure, and there will be also will be nothing. So it is not, so, so I mean, uh, the energy is there, but it takes some, um, like some skill uh, to actually convert it uh, to moisture transport and the needed circulation pattern. Okay. So the scale, scale is important. So um, in traditional meteorology, when you take out, when the water molecules condense, you know, and so into the cloud, and so that you kind of taken out of that, uh, that, that column of air. So what does traditional meteorology say then happens next? Well, as I, as I said to you, uh, when, when there is condensation, there is uh, the release of latent heat. And so when there is, uh, convection and the air is rising and water vapor condenses, we have latent heat release. And this um, column gets warmer than the surroundings. And the conventional meteorologist says that as it is warmer, this isolated cloud, it is bioned, like floating, right? It goes up. And then we have this, uh, uh, pattern like near a hot battery, right? When central heating battery, which we have in our homes. Uh, so, so, so 
traditional meteorology focuses on latent heat, like the, as the driver of these motions. Oh, okay. So the reason the air parcel rises is because of latent heat. Um, and you're saying yes. it's because of the yes. pressure, or, pressure or, vacuum. Yes, 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 yes. So it should be like it should there should be some um, disturbance first, some some uh, impetus for it to rise. Okay, because before it condenses, it is there is no latent heat. But suppose there is a small push of air, like due to something, just due to fluctuation of air motions, and the air goes up. And then if it is close to saturation and condensation begins, there is latent heat. And once there is latent heat, it is warmer and it goes on. That's that's the the traditional story. And it, it is like it is true in 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 some aspects, but the and it is also like a qualitative explanation. It works in some like in some examples, uh, like with the with an isolated cloud. With an isolated cloud, it works. Why? Because I I told uh, I I told you that for isolated cloud, uh, the uh, there is um, uh, like um, if if we don't have latent heat, we don't have uh, buoyancy, but just have a small area where condensation occurs, then it could be that the air streams from all sides to this area and no um, uh, no uh, concerted air motion develops. So this could be the case. So, but when we have a large territory with, with a convection occurring over a large territory, then this cannot happen because we have uh, pressure reduction over a large territory, and then there is a preferential air motion towards this territory, you see? So you're saying the pressure difference is greater than any latent heat generated, and so they shouldn't, it wouldn't you be see, able to account for it. You see, this is, uh, this is, uh, was a matter of uh, like heated debates and uh, what is, which effect dominates. And, uh, if we look uh, how how to calculate uh, this, because latent heat is heat, right? It is heat. Pressure reduction is uh, like a change of pressure. They have different units. How to compare heat, uh, right, with pressure? <laughs> so which which effect is more important? Uh, but um, we could we could do the following. We can compare one column with the latent heat release and lapse rate, moist lapse rate with latent heat to another column without latent heat. This column will be warmer and we can uh, compare pressure at this height where it is warmer. As it is warmer, its pressure is higher and we can compare this pressure, right? Do, do, do you follow? Yeah. So, and compare this pressure difference with the pressure difference from uh, which will form if you just condense all vapor and remove it from the column. Then the column pressure at the surface will be less than it was, right? Less air in the column. So we can do this. And <clears throat> this was done as a first criticism to our work. And they said that, oh, look, this latent heat pressure difference is much higher, like several times higher than what you are seeing, this pressure reduction from water vapor. However, uh, when we are talking, and this is what was debated about. However, when you compare this uh, pressure difference here, you, uh, uh, it is just one branch of the uh, thermodynamic cycle, which we need to consider to estimate total work, right? So we cannot, uh, for example, if we 
look at the circulation, we must explain a steady state circulation. And it is not just rising air, but also the descending air, right? So when we have a cycle, and in, in this cycle, you, you have the rising branch and you have also the descending branch. And then when we calculate the efficiency with which latent heat is converted to work, this efficiency can be uh, even uh, negative under atmospheric conditions. So the, while latent heat release and the pressure increase that it produces in the upper atmosphere is big, but it is all compensated in the, uh, by the low efficiency in the cycle. And why low efficiency? It is not like very something straightforward, but uh, I tell you. Why? why the efficiency is low? Because as I already told you, you have warm air, but when you, uh, the air descends, all this warmth plays against you because you need to push down warm air. You see? Okay, and yeah. so basically all work that you get here, it is very big. And we calculate it, it is big indeed. But then all this work is spent to push the air down and there are uh, like calculations done not by us, by independent researchers uh, who show that there is no, uh, no um, like, uh, no uh, indication that this process has a, has a positive efficiency. So there are cases when this work is even smaller than the work that is needed to push the air down. So negative efficiency. Meanwhile, when you have pressure reduction at the surface, at the expense of gas removal from the, due to condensation and pressure reduction, the other mechanism, you don't have this compensation. And so this is pure work. And, and uh, although uh, it is, this pressure reduction is smaller than the gross uh, pressure increase due to latent heat, it is not multiplied by efficiency. It is not heat. It is potential energy. So there was much confusion in all this. But recently, I must tell you that very recently there was a publication which basically shows uh, what we wrote like in 2012, repeats this idea that indeed, uh, when you model a hurricane, you notice that uh, although it is supposed to be a steady state, there is evaporation, condensation, but you notice that it's intensity maximum velocity decreases with time in the model. And they found that this is because there is uh, so uh, little moisture remaining in the descending branch that this uh, expensive power expenses to push the air down become so great that the hurricane stops in the model. So basically this, this effect, uh, if you understand that it exists, you can see it, how it uh, is pronounced. But okay. it is, you see, it is a complicated story. It, right, yeah. So, yeah, so let me just try and summarize. So if you just look at one column of air and you do the calculations, it seems like the latent heat um, that's released by the, by the cloud formation is, it is more of a bigger effect than the vacuum that creates the pressure. But mm -hmm. you need to actually look at the whole cycle of water or the air cycle. So say when it comes in from the ocean, it, uh, the air sucks in and it goes up and then comes back down in a whole cycle. That, so basically it, it needs to be driven that whole cycle, right? And so some work has to be done to drive it. And if, you, if you're depending on the latent heat released by the water vapor to do it, it, it isn't as efficient because that heat needs to go down and, and you know, hot air doesn't want to go down. So it's, it's, it's a lot less efficient. So it's basically, I guess, a thermodynamic engine of sorts. So similar to how like a refrigerator is a thermodynamic engine and in your car is a thermodynamic, it's driven, it's, 
So like we need some kind of power to drive the whole air currents on earth. And, uh, and, the, and the latent heat release is not enough of a driver. You need, the, you need this biotic pump to drive the whole system. Yes. And, and now you see how it, uh, how it uh, worked on the ideological uh, level. Uh, the fact that latent heat is inefficient is kind of known by the meteorologists. And that is why forests were not considered as players uh, in, in atmospheric dynamics. Because what they can do, just latent heat coming from their transpiration. So this, this is basically uh, was known that latent heat is inefficient. But when we came and said, look, there is another process uh, 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 to, uh, to say that we are wrong, people begin to, began to compare our effect with this gross effect of latent heat, gross effect, not the net low efficiency, but with the gross um, uh, pressure, uh, 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 pressure uh, like increase due to temperature. And, but if it was true that latent heat is so important, then going back to forest, forest must play a major role in atmospheric circulation. You see, so, so one way or, or another, if uh, uh, forests are important. So now criticism against the biotic pump, they have this logical deficiency because <laughs> as I said, if latent heat is inefficient, then it is inefficient and don't compare it to our uh, effect which we show we make uh, um, we make estimates what is the power produced by what the vapor condensation uh, according to our uh, view and it matches uh, the the observed power so if latent heat and force are inefficient don't compare don't say that it is more than our power if it is so efficient as you see then go back to forest and accept them as a major player in atmospheric dynamics. So you cannot have it both uh, that we are wrong and forests don't matter. So some of our supporters say that one way or another, but forests are important in atmospheric dynamics. And how does it compare to say a lake or wetlands? Because um, wetlands also um, release water vapor. Yes, yes, that's true. How it compares to the ocean itself, because mm -hmm. we have two thirds of the earth uh, uh, covered by the ocean, and there is a lot of evaporation and condensation. And here, uh, the, um, uh, the, what we think is important is control. So, uh, how the forest adds water to the atmosphere. If there is a lake, right? And humidity grows, for example, right? Then the, the more, cl the closer the air is to saturation, the less there will be evaporation from, from lake, right? Like when you have a very humid room, there won't be much evaporation from a saucer with water, right? Mm -hmm. But if we look, for example, but we know that the more humid the atmosphere, the more, the, the greater the probability of rain. So for the forest, it would be beneficial to transpire more when the atmosphere is wet. And and this is not, this goes against, you know, thermodynamics. And what we know now from the Amazon, I can show you the graph if you want. <laughs> it does exactly the same. When, uh, for example, when there is a, uh, 
before the wet season, before the wet season, the forest begins to make new leaves and to transpire actively. And the more it transpires, the more humid atmosphere becomes. And the lake here would begin to transpire less. But the forest doesn't stop. It still creates new leaves, new uh, evaporative surfaces, which bring more and more water to the atmosphere, such that at a certain point, we have convection switched off, on, and there is uh, the wet season starts in the Amazon. So due to the fact that forest functions on the basis of highly ordered solar energy, at the expense of this energy, it can perform processes that won't happen in a simple thermodynamic system, like a lake. Like, yeah. why, why, why does a forest, uh, is that just true in the Amazon and tropics? Like you're saying that the forest transpires more water when it becomes wet season or just before wet season. Why is that? Before, why does it do that? Uh, uh, you see, in the tropics, normally what uh, we have uh, most of our plants covered by the ocean so major circulation systems are related to the ocean and we have the so-called intertropical convergence zone which is the zone near equator where uh, there is ascending air motion and a rain belt equatorial rain belt and it ha has seasonal migration uh, to the southern and to the northern atmosphere. And imagine it is Earth and this rain belt. And so when it arrives at a certain latitude in the tropics, there is the rainy season. Then it goes like to the north and there is dry season. And uh, so in the majority of places on Earth, the wet and dry season is related to this uh, seasonal motion. Now, in the Amazon forest, the wet season starts two months in advance of the arrival of this tropical rain belt. And it was a puzzle. Nobody knew how it happens. Why, why is it so? How it could be that this uh, wet season uh, begins two months in advance? But then they began to study the phenology of leaves. And they found that during the dry season, during the dry season, when everywhere, imagine a dry season ecosystem, everything is dry, it uh, seems no life. But in the Amazon, the dry season is different. In the end of dry season, like two months, well, it is not even the end, it is just the dry season. Suddenly, the forest begins to make new leaves, more and more. And these new leaves, they are like leaf flushing. They are active young leaves, and they transpire a lot at the expense of accumulated moisture in the soil. And they moisten the atmosphere. And that they moisten the atmosphere was measured from the isotopic composition of the atmosphere. because. There is a difference in the air that evaporated from the oceanic surface and the air that uh, is evaporated from leaves, from transpired from leaves. Uh, uh, heavy isotopes behave differently in this. So isotopic composition, uh, like uh, uh, is, is different and you can trace the origin of the water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, studying this isotopic composition. So not only we can see that the forest makes leaves, not only we can see that the atmosphere becomes wetter, but also we know that it becomes wetter because of increased evaporation from the leaves. And we also know that when the atmosphere becomes wetter, the probability of rainfall increases. And when there is rainfall increases, so the pressure drops and we have this uh, moisture inflow. And this is all, uh, uh, and this is a very 
uh, uh, like um, picturesque example that the forest acts against our thermodynamic expectations. It increases ev evapotranspiration and it increases this more and more as the atmosphere becomes moisture, moist, more humid. So, but, but this is only like top of the iceberg because there are also such things as uh, biogenic, um, uh, like condensation nuclei, like when you add small aerosol particles to the atmosphere, you can change the saturation uh, temperature. And basically uh, when the air is very clean, so it, water vapor won't condense even at very low temperatures, but when you add something, like forest produces aerosols, you, the forest can induce condensation at higher temperatures. So they can be very fine tuning. Uh, and, and imagine different aerosols could play different roles. And these aerosols are produced not even by trees, but by the associated biota, like by fungi, bacteria, uh, many other organisms in the forest. So it is a joint response. And we, it can be uh, very complex, like we don't even know how our own organism functions in details. But the, the, the difference, as you asked, with the, with the simple system, just what, is this ability of uh, control. And it is possible because uh, at the expense, because um, vegetation functions at the expense of solar energy, which is highly ordered, like uh, sun is um, uh, 6,000 uh, degrees and the earth is like 300. So, uh, uh, so the um, Carnot efficiency, maximum efficiency with which you can, uh, turn solar energy to useful work. It's almost on earth, it is almost unity. So you can do whatever you want, like evaporating more under humid conditions or whatever you want. So you can control it. Once there is a physical mechanism there, which produces air motion, the main thing that the forest does is to control it. It is like, you know, a nuclear explosion and the nuclear power plant. Power plant is a controlled thing. Uh, you get useful things out of it. But nuclear explosion is like a hurricane. It is uncontrolled release of power. So the main, uh, the main thing that the ecosystem does is to put this power under control and to benefit from this power. And that is why when we lose natural ecosystems, we have a chaos, we have a draft, we have flood suddenly, because why floods? Because it is, uh, there is a positive feedback. If by some chance uh, there are humid conditions and there is convection, strong convection, then there is inflow uh, like a hurricane. So if there is no control, anything can happen. Although the general trend would be to, to dry. Uh, land will get dry. Oh, interesting. So the main thing is that of control, of regulation. As, uh, I, so how, I, would, uh, how would that work in California? Because in California, we have more rain in the winter. In, and that's the wet season is the winter and in the dry in the summer is when we have less rain so as it heats up the trees should evapotranspire more right but it doesn't help because it's going into dry season so does this how does it work in say in mediterranean climates like california well you do you know i know i don't know the details but yeah one thing with california is that you don't have uh, many natural ecosystems, as I understand. So, so how it worked, uh, we cannot judge at the moment how it how it worked when it was natural. 
when it is uh, when we have uh, mostly agricultural systems, they cannot, of course, uh, uh, control the water cycle. And in this sense, uh, uh, like when you cannot control it, uh, you uh, it is if you cannot uh, you see what what is what is the uh, uh, the caveat if there is two is if there are dry conditions and you transpire like a tree transpires but the saturation point is not reached all this vapor will be lost you see so the tree has transpired but the atmosphere is still dry and there is no condensation no uh, the water doesn't uh, the water vapor doesn't rise and there is no inflow and then all this transpiration goes away and in this sense for those plants who don't control it who, who don't control the water cycle it is more uh, like uh, prudent uh, uh, not to transpire during the dry season and and uh, we humans, as I said, we like uh, and use early successional plants. What are they? So imagine a natural forest, natural ecosystem. There are some always some disturbances. For example, a big tree falls out. There is a, a big lawn, and there is so called gap dynamics, like. So there is a lawn and there are so-called pioneer species. First, there are herbs and bushes and all this. And this, these um, plants, they don't need, and they didn't need to evolve uh, a control of the water cycle because for them, it is done by the trees, by the surrounding trees. But when we now destroy all the trees, but only take these early successional plants from which most of our agricultural plants originate. And we make large fields with these plants who are not competent to control the water cycle without, uh, without trees. And they, they uh, uh, what they do, they just waste water, and that's it. So, and in this sense, uh, uh, when you go into this, so it is dangerous when you get too dry because it is not easy to go back to the way state. And the California, as I said, like, uh, um, it is not our concept uh, it was developed independently but it was uh, developed and it is called landscape trap so when the landscape is disturbed uh, such that the vegetation loses control over the water cycle gets drier then there are more fires then it is disturbed even further and at a certain moment it is so dry that it uh, it just put on the degradation trajectory. So it is a, like landscape trap. And so uh, in California, uh, the situation is uh, uh, very close to that in my view. And by the way, uh, there is a, a very um, uh, deep uh, thinking uh, Professor Milan Milan, whose interview I uh, he worked in the Mediterranean uh, Environmental Institute or something was the director of him of this institute, and he uh, he coined this phrase that uh, uh, storms in the Mediterranean must be cultivated, in that sense that if there is vegetation and trees on the seashore then there is the air is close enough to saturation and there are uh, rains and in the interview that i 
listened to uh, re recently. It was made by uh, John Schuld from uh, uh, Ecological Restoration Alliance. Mil Milan said that he was warning about the disaster coming to California, like 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, he's quite old now, looking at what is being done to the landscape there. So that drying is coming for him was evident. So it is, uh, it is, it is ubiquitous. You see, in Siberia, for example, uh, you have very large uh, cutting, uh, logging, and then there is logging, and then there is uh, temperature rise, and then there are fires, which destroy even more uh, forest than logging. And then there is disruption to the water cycle, and then there are fires again. And it is convenient to blame them to the global warming and not the local practices. But um, in fact, this is this landscape trap in action. And the uh, way we are going with all this is uh, not very. Uh, so, not very good, yeah. <laughs> not very. Yes, not very <laughs> Nothing, nothing positive, unfortunately. So, but if we don't understand what is going on, and if we continue to, you know, to blame, uh, of course, there is global warming, uh, especially in the northern hemisphere. We know that it is pronounced. But when you disrupt uh, the vegetation, the temperature changes that occur go beyond any. Uh, like global effects, and they affect for the, they have a legacy. Uh, these uh, disruptions have a long term legacy and determine the further disturbance regime. And there is this positive feedback that accumulates the disaster. So we need to be aware of it somehow. Mm. And, and, to, and there are hots, there are still spots when the ecosystem somehow miraculously re re remains self-sustainable. I'm sure that in California, there are also such like areas as, I, as far as I know. And so these areas must be protected like, you know, like greatest treasure because from them, this self-sustainability could spread by restoration. They still know how, how to do the trick, how, how to survive, how to control. So. Um, I, yeah, I was just wondering, maybe I could, uh, I just wanted to ask another question about the biotic pump. So I took a quick read of, um, I think Nistas or someone that their critique of your thing. And I just want to kind of, uh, when you wrote your original biotic pump paper. And I just wanna kind of run it by you to see if I understand um, what they were saying and then your response. So I just wanna actually, if I could just bring up, um, okay, so um, may, maybe I just kind of explain So it seems like there's two types of equilibrium they were talking about, hydrostatic equilibrium and thermodynamic equilibrium. And so as I understand it, like hydrostatic equilibrium, it's kind of like if you have say balance a whole bunch of books will ride on top of each other the top book will exert some pressure on the book beneath it now exert so by the time you get to the bottom book it's exerting a lot more pressure um and so same with the air in above the atmosphere we have i mean air still has some weight and so the top you know top of the atmosphere that's exerting pressure lower and lower and so that's so the so there's so there's less air up top because it has it needs to hold up less Let's say so that's hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, and then if you say have you you release say a helium balloon, that's in non-equilibrium because um, the amount of air inside the helium is less or weighs less, and so we actually rise. Um, and then I think it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, there's also this thermodynamic equilibrium where uh, molecules can diffuse around and uh, and actually form that um, 
so so the molecules themselves diffuse around to, to kind of form that density pattern of, of you know le less air molecules up top. But that's a slower process than hydrostatic non-equilibrium where the air parcel just moves up. Is that kind of correct? Would you say? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is correct. But also instead of a pile of books, imagine that you have like a pile of uh, springs on each other. Then the the um, lowest spring is most compressed right if you put one spring and small weight and, and then the, the, what the, the condensation does it takes one weight from one spring and the whole the whole bunch of springs uh like springs up you see if you have a spring put a weight and then you remove and it uh, goes up and this is a rapid dynamic process which is has nothing to do with diffusion so okay mm -hmm. so um so okay so this is i just did a quick diagram so if the white particles in that top picture are you know some other air molecules and then the black one is the water vapor so at the lower level you i just drew like three and just as a very abstract, there are three other air particles and three water vapor. Above it is like two air particles and two water vapor. And then at a higher level, it's like one air particle and one water vapor. But when, uh, when, uh, when say the cloud condensates, then one of these black particles disappears, the, the water disappears. So the question is what then happens? And I think what you're saying is that it creates this non-equilibrium situation, if I'm, if I'm correct. And so the air parcel will rise Whereas the traditional uh, meteorological, the Mises is saying that it's still in hydrodynamic equilibrium, is that right? And somehow it's still in hydrodynamic equilibrium because each layer expands a little bit. Is that, is that, or is that, I'm trying to, I was trying to figure out what the traditional meteorological explanation is of how it deals with the fact that one of the black particles or water particles disappears from the highest layer. Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't deal with it in any, way so so there is no conventional uh, uh meteorological explanation to this so i cannot tell you whether masters uh, at all uh, correctly uh, reproduce conventional meteorology uh, because uh, due to the focus on latent heat this effect is not considered at all so this what happens with the disequilibrium you won't read about it in any textbook. No, no explanation. It's just not taken into account. So, oh, oh, what, oh, okay. So, what seems like he was saying that the whole system stays in hydrostatic equilibrium, whereas you're saying an air parcel will rise. You're saying an air parcel will rise. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. They, so that's a non-equilibrium. And where's he? I think he's saying that. I assume it's a he. Um, that it's a. Uh, it's. Um, the, 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 there is, won't be any air parcels rising, right? I think it just each of the layers just expands a little bit. Is that what he? I don't know if that's what he's trying to say. But I think he's saying no air air parcel will rise. Is that correct? You think? Mm, you'd better ask them. Okay. All right. <laughs> the, the, the mean. because you know, uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, in 2018, uh -huh. there was another critique in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences, uh, which like uh, tried to develop the ideas by Mr. Seto uh, in a more, uh, you know, like formalized way, because what Mr. Seto said is just like words. So and we wrote a response to this, uh, like critique, it was uh, totally. Mm. So it was not uh, based on solid physics. Like, uh, so it is not. It is not possible somehow. I cannot. I cannot tell you. Uh, um, with latent heat, I understand there is some logic, and it is wrong only in our view, quantitatively. You see, it could work with the latent heat. What they say, I cannot, I cannot formulate a logical, non-contradictory uh, critique to which I could uh, 
uh, respond. There is, there is no logic, as I see. So okay. we just try to respond to what we, just to some statements, but I cannot see what picture they have in their head. Unlike with the latent heat. With the latent heat objection, I can tell you, there is indeed logic and it is only about the magnitude of the efficiency that is associated with latent heat. Okay. So yeah, okay. So but here, but here you, you quite the, understand. Okay, right. Yeah, I think they're saying in their system that there's no even yeah movement of the air it, um, if you don't take into account the latent heat. So, but let me uh, try to explain a little bit or what I was trying to understand your response. So, um, so I just kind of drew like, um, so a rising air parcel, if it has water va vapor, will kind of lose water vapor as it rises because it condenses out. And so here we have the wet adiabatic lapse rate. So it's 30 degrees, say, at the surface of the earth, 20 degrees higher up, and then 10 degrees higher up. And so the adiabatic lapse rate is the rate at which the temperature goes down because um, because the, your parcel is uh, losing water vapor and also releasing latent heat. Um, and then uh, on, the, on the far right, I kind of have this, uh, like a temperature gradient, which is even less. So like 30 degrees, then 25 degrees and 20 degrees higher up. So that's a smaller differential. And supposedly, I guess an air parcel with water vapor won't rise, right? When there's less of a temperature differential, is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, it won't, uh, yes. If uh, the air is warmer, so uh -huh. it will be difficult. If there is no external power to drive it, it won't rise by itself. For right. Sure. Okay. And then, from what I understood in your reply comment, you were saying that um, in a in a in the normal meteorological sense, if the temperature is just at the same as the wet adiabatic lapse rate, then then um, I think traditionally there there'll be no nothing happening. But you're saying that because the weight of the air is less at the top, there's a corresponding pressure that goes all the way down. And so the air parcel will rise. And so it's contradict it contradicts what normal meteorology might say. If, if the temperature differential is exactly at the wet adiabatic lapse rate, traditional meteorology would say nothing happens, whereas you're saying there will be an air parcel yes, rise. This, this, that's correct. That's okay. the correct interpretation, yes. Um, So, okay, cool. <laughs> um, okay, cool. I think that's, 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 I think that's, uh, yeah. So basically you're saying that it's not, yeah, it's no longer in hydrostatic equilibrium. And so the air parcel has to rise. So that's what you're saying differently. Um, okay, cool. Um, Cool. Uh, well, maybe uh, I think we've gone off a bit, so maybe we could. Uh, maybe we should end it here. Um. Yeah, <laughs> because <laughs> it can go on. Yes, yes, uh, yes. But one thing I wanted to add to your picture that um, mm. uh, there can be situation. Uh, you see, uh, there must be. Uh, it is like self-sustainable picture. If we just make condensation in one local air parcel, right? So it could be that no, uh, the pressure will go down even if we ignore the latent heat, but it is not guaranteed that we will have all the, you know, air motion like up to the atmosphere. You need to have some, like uh, initial conditions, proper initial conditions. But in the same sense, like you don't have hurricanes every day, right? You you need, uh, and why hurricanes arise, you need also the angular momentum such that there is a special geometry of the circulation. So again, as I said, water vapor provides this energy, which can be, uh, Trans, transformed to kinetic energy, but it also depends on the conditions, when it can and when it can uh, be done. The scale, as I said, is very important. 
so, uh, so for example, when we have fog, like one of the objections, you have fog and there is nothing. Yes, we have fog, which is a very small level of condensation under very unfavorable conditions of uh, atmospheric stratification when uh, the top, the uh, surface is colder than the than the upper atmosphere, like, like at night. So it is uh, clear physics. So it cannot, uh, we need to take everything into account. But basically what you said is correct. Traditional meteorology says that when there is no temperature gradient, nothing happens. We say, yes, it will happen. Uh, and forest knows how to arrange it to happen, how to perform, uh, to arrange, uh, uh, conditions that are needed for that. Are there, I think I saw someone had done some experiment, right? So I think it was in their backyard or something like they had some cooling device and, and an air chamber, a wind chamber, and it, they they created wind. Is that right? Or is that? This is, this is uh, I told uh, this um, about this, my opinion. Uh, so this is doesn't uh, work and has nothing to do with the biotic pump uh, because uh, uh, so there was it is just by driven circulation uh, with cold air going down and warm air goes up it's just just where cold and where air cold going down. So it is precisely that uh, case when buoyancy is greater than the effect from condensation. Oh, we so need, yeah. So, so the experiment need, doesn't show anything you're saying. Okay. It, what kind of, is there a way to do experimentally, what would be a good experiment to test the body? Um, uh, well, <clears throat> um, you see, the, there is such a thing, uh, I, I was uh, mentioning it for some time, but <laughs> nobody was impressed. Uh, there are such things, uh, if I remember, uh, they called like heat pipes. And these are, um, um, these are like tubes, uh, which are used to efficiently uh, draw heat away from some places that are difficult to reach. And they are based on uh, a similar principle. A tube is filled with uh, condensable, like with water vapor, for example, or with vapor of some substance. And then it, uh, the hot tube of the, uh, the hot end of the, tube you attach to the surface that you want to cool and then you uh, have one um, one uh, hot end is hot and cool and is cold and so this uh, 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 sorry <laughs> this vapor is in disequilibrium because here at the hot uh, it has high saturated concentration and here at the cold end it is it has much lower concentration because of being colder and then the there is a huge mo movement uh, of uh, of uh, this vapor very very rapid like in a hurricane like almost molecular velocity and this huge uh, flow of course takes a lot of heat away because there is condensation on the cold end. And so it is an efficient cooler. And this is, um, this is uh, the effect uh, that uh, also is in the, uh, this, um, this very efficient flow is what happens in the biotic pump as well. But with the complication that there are other gases around also. So, so possibly it could be it could be possible to arrange something um, along these lines, but you need to somehow um, to manage the geometry uh, somehow. It seems like you want because you're saying the work cycle is important. So it would might be, be nice to have something that circulates around. 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here, so there are some uh, caveats. Yes. So when you have this um, this type of uh, stuff, you have in every corner you have a lot of turbulence, like when the air has to, you know. To, uh -huh. In the atmosphere, the atmosphere is free. Uh, so friction is at the surface mostly. And so their conditions are very different. But I think that uh, some clever people, if they are uh, like um, uh, enthusiastic about this, could think of something. Uh, yeah, because it seems so, like if you have some kind of square that's maybe vertical or something or a square pipe, like those around in a square. So then you actually have a thermodynamic engine because that's what you were trying to show, right? And then maybe at one end you have a cooling area, so it cools, but it it's still, yeah. So so then it creates that pressure difference, but it can drive the whole cycle. Maybe that air would flow. Um, I, I have a question. Also, uh, just say you have a water on a on a frying pan, say, and you heat that water, right? So when at first when you heat it, you know you just have little bubbles, but after a while you get this convection pattern where the water, hot water goes up and then it also comes back down again, right? So it creates this, it's called a Bernard cell. So have you heard of that? Where the, the so you don't just have water, you don't just have the hot water moving up to the top, but it also kind of stop, forms this convection pattern, like a circular, do, do you know what but I'm talking this about? Also, this also, this convection also forms without boiling also. In without effect. what, sorry? Without boiling. If you just warm a pan of water, right. there is um, there is some convection. But you are yeah. right that with with boiling, it becomes much more vigorous. Yeah. So, but that in that case, it, it's still spinning, but it doesn't require the condensation, right? Or it doesn't require the um, the biotic pump. So it's still creating a yeah, of course, of course. We don't we don't say in the least that the biotic pump is the only mechanism that makes things move. You know, right? <laughs> you that? So, okay. uh, of course, uh, ordinary convection, uh, like uh, based on uh, density differences, this is something like we see every day, and we cannot deny it. Uh, okay, so you're all so oh, right. So there's normal convection on Earth then maybe you can calculate just from the heating of the Earth's surface. But to, in order to generate the larger winds, you're saying you 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 need something like the biotic pump to generate the larger winds we see on Earth? You, you see, uh, uh, normal uh, for for the Earth, for the Earth, it is not, it is not um, straightforward to calculate the efficiency of normal convection because it, there are too many uh, processes. Uh, so it is not as, as, as straightforward as, as it might seem. And that the biotic pump mechanism uh, does indeed work follows from the fact that those estimates that it produces match the observed power of general circulation on Earth. So, so there is a theoretical estimate which just take observed condensation rate and uh, predict how much power it will generate. And it matches. So of course it could be like, you know, coincidence, but okay, it is general circulation. Then we go to hurricanes. It is a different type of circulation. And we see, let us take a look. Condensation rate is different. Special scale is different. Let us take a look how much power it produces. And it also matches. So. These are arguments that the, there is at least something to look seriously at. You see? So, so, so I guess in traditional meteorology, you have winds because some it lands are hotter than other land, you know, or the ocean is colder. And so the air will move um, because of the pressure differences caused by hot and cold. And, but they, will, like and, and they will, and they will indeed move. The, the matter is whether their movement will be much less powerful in a dry atmosphere, or it will be the same. We see that without water vapor and its disequilibrium, it will be much less powerful than it is now. So the water vapor plays a dominant role. This is all what we say, without uh, denying what cannot 
be denied, you see. Right, okay. And is this a published paper too? Like where you've calculated the, the larger? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, interesting. Cool, and then it seems like with hurricanes, especially if you can do a much better calculation with the biotic pump theory for hurricane as opposed to traditional meteorology, and you can actually get some numbers, that, then that seems, like you said you are, that seems like a good evidence that the biotic pump is probably yes, more correct, yes. right? The, yes, the main idea is to get it actually into the mainstream because it is, it has, it's every mainstream has its own inertia. It is, uh, doesn't change easily. So it, it is a lot of work. And if you're saying just to kind of this whole research paradigm to kind of further prove this, what do you think of some of the main calculations, experiments, or what, what would be some of the things you would like to look at next or have other people work on to try and prove it further? Uh, uh, well, um, well, I have my research on the research program, uh, which is very exciting, but I cannot uh, say like anything at the moment. Okay. Uh, but well. uh, so, so I I think it is you know it is the magic of science. It cannot be I cannot say go and do something. It is uh, like you know when if somebody asked me what are you going to write, I don't know. All those papers that I wrote or, or published or everything in science that I found. I couldn't plan. That is why we never got any grants, you know, any research grants, <laughs> because I cannot plan that next year we will formulate the biotic pump. It is not guaranteed, you know. So, so it is, but I think that people who uh, like go into the essence of what we propose and then have this vision and look, uh, like armored with this vision, they will be able to find uh, interesting things. So have you converted some of the meteorologists or climatologists or some of the physicists to this biotic pump or, or are there other people uh, who are now working on it too in the field? Uh, well, we have quite some co colleagues with whom we are advancing this. So I'm very proud that we are not alone. So we have supporters. We are also uh, like quoted, our works are quoted. So apparently some people find some value in what we are saying. So we should see, we should see. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, best of luck. <laughs> and uh, cool. Well, thank you very much for uh, speaking to me. Yeah, um, thank you for your interest. Yes, thank cool. you. Thank you.